Hints on Child Training, H. Clay Trumbull, Chapter 2, The Duty of Training Children. It is the mistake of many parents to suppose that their chief duty is in loving and counseling their children, rather than in loving and training them. That they are faithfully to show their children what they ought to do, rather than to make them do it. The training power of the parent is, as a rule, sadly undervalued. Too many parents seem to take it for granted that because their children are by nature very timid and retiring, or very bold and forward, very extravagant in speech and manner, or quite disinclined to express even a dutiful sense of gratitude or, and trust, reckless in their generosity, or pitiably selfish, disposed to overstudy or given wholly to play, one-sided in this or in that, or in the other, trait or quality or characteristic. Therefore those children must remain so, unless indeed they outgrow their faults or are induced by wise counsel and loving entreaty to overcome them. My boy is irrepressible, says one father, he is full of dash and spirits. He makes havoc in the house while at home, and when he goes out to a neighbor's, he either has things his own way or he doesn't want to go there again. I really wish he had a quieter nature, but of course I can't change him. I have given him a great many talks about this, and I hope he will outgrow the worst of it. Still, he is just what he is and punishing him wouldn't make him anybody else. A good mother, on the other hand, is exercised because her little son is so bashful that he is always mortifying her before strangers. He will put his finger in his mouth, and hang down his head, and twist one foot over the other, and refuse to shake hands, or to answer the visitors, How do you do, my boy? Or even to say, I thank you, with distinctness when anything is given to him. And the same trouble is found with the tastes as with the temperaments of children. One is always ready to hear stories read or told, but will not sit quiet and look at pictures or use a slate and pencil. Another, a little older, will devour books of travel or adventure, but has no patience with a simple story of home life or a book of instruction in matters of practical fact. Now, it is quite inevitable that children should have these peculiarities. But it is not inevitable that they should continue to exhibit them offensively. Children can be trained in almost any direction. Their natural tendencies may be so curbed and guided as no longer to show themselves in disagreeable prominence. It is a parent's privilege, and it is a parent's duty, to make his children, by God's blessing, to be and to do what they should be and do, rather than what they would like to be and do. If indeed this were not so, a parent's mission would be sadly limited in scope, and diminished in importance and preciousness. The parent who does not recognize the possibility of training his children, as well as instructing them, misses one of the highest privileges as a parent and fails in his most important work for his children. The skilled physician in charge of a certain institution for the treatment of developmentally disabled and imperfectly developed children has said that some children who are brought to him are lacking in just one important trait or quality while they possess a fair measure of every other. Or it may be said that they have an excess of the trait or quality opposite to that which they lack. One girl, for example, will be wholly without a sense of honesty, will even be possessed with a love of stealing for stealing's sake, carrying it to such an extent that when seated at the table she will snatch a ball of butter from a plate and wrap it up in a fold of her dress. If she should be unchecked in this propensity, until she were a grown woman, she might prove one of the fashionable ladies 
who take books or dry goods from the stores where they are shopping under the influence of kleptomania. Again, a boy has no sense of truth. He will tell lies without any apparent temptation to do so, even against his own obvious interests. All of us have seen persons of this sort in mature life. Some of them are today in places of prominence in Christian work and influence. Yet another child is without any sense of reverence or of modesty or of natural affection. One lacks all control of his temper, another of his nerves, and so on, in great variety. The physician of that institution is by no means in despair over any of these cases. It is his mission to find out the child's special lack and to meet it, to learn what traits are in excess and to curb them, to know the child's needs and to train him accordingly. Every child is in a sense a partially developed and imperfectly formed child. There are no absolutely perfect children in this world. All of them need restraining in some things and stimulating in others. And every imperfect child can be helped toward a symmetrical character by wise Christian training. Every home should be an institution for the treatment of imperfectly developed children. Every father and every mother should be a skilled physician in, every, in charge of such an institution. There are glorious possibilities in this direction, and there are weighty responsibilities also. <laughs>